Well, hello again and welcome back to Rare Classic Cars. It's one of those nicer days as we head into spring here on the weekend and wanted to showcase a, I think another special vehicle from the halcyon days or the best days of General Motors. And that is this 1967 Oldsmobile Delta 88 Holiday Hardtop Coupe. And yes, that is the real name of it. It's quite lengthy. Thank goodness it isn't the custom 88 holiday hardtop coupe which they also had this is just the base delta 88 although one step above the del monte 88 and in 1967 this is really before Olds came into its own with the cutlass franchise it really picked up in the late 60s and in through the late 1970s that propelled the division to a million plus sales per year at this point Olds is still trying to find its footing a little bit in terms of what it wants to be one year prior to this car, they had introduced the 1966 Tornado, General Motors' four, first full-size front-wheel drive, non-experimental vehicle. And it took one more year for Cadillac to introduce an Eldorado off of the same platform. Olds had the front-wheel drive exclusive for 1966. So Olds was going into being more of a technology leader and kind of capitalizing on that technology leader let's say marketing speak but also reality that has started really with their introduction of the overhead valve v8 in 1949 and by this point though Olds had kind of lost its way a little bit you know it wasn't quite sure what it wanted to be it was a bit you know not necessarily the most exciting cars often bought by older clientele but well engineered and well thought out but Olds had a new division general manager by this time and his name was John Belts. He was the chief engineer for Oldsmobile previous to that so he had been the lead engineer for the Tornado program and his vision for the division was really to change it up to be more youthful and exciting and you see a couple years after this car that Olds tagline becomes the young mobiles even and they start to have some exciting vehicles like the Tornado and the 442, the 442W30, the Hearst Olds. Um, and a number of, I would say, packages and suspension setups that were more oriented towards sportiness in some cases versus ride in the past. This is a perfect example. I also have a 1965 6 Pontiac and I've driven 1967 Pontiacs. And despite the fact that Pontiac had this reputation for being the sporty car, the suspension package in Pontiac on the base cars was significantly softer than what's in the base car in this Oldsmobile. In fact, the stabilizer bar diameter on this 67 Olds and the spring rates are about identical to the Pontiacs with the firm ride and handling package. So you get an Olds of this era and it doesn't ride like a wallowy, wishy-washy, you know, lanyard. It actually rides like a competent vehicle. It handles pretty well, certainly not by modern day standards, but by standards of the time, it handles quite well. And it's absolutely silky smooth. I said at the front of the video that this was really the halcyon days of General Motors, and at least in my opinion, it was. Everything on these late 60s GM cars, when you compare it to cars just four or five years later, feels so much tighter. The door closures, the steering feel in some cases, the way the transmission engages various gears and the slop in the drive line, even the engine smoothness, it's just a cut above what would happen a few years later. And it's almost like the engineers and the manufacturers uh, stopped caring a little bit and said, well, we can have sloppier tolerances on just about everything. And it becomes noticeable. But this car and cars of this era from General Motors, 1965, 6, 7, I would even say 68, a really peak GM. You can argue going all the way to 1970, but the interiors had started becoming a bit cheap by then. I think you can even make an argument that peak GM stops about 1970, but by then some of the interior bits had already become a bit cheap, although a number of new powertrains were introduced for 1970. But let's take a walk around this vehicle and describe some of the special features and why I think it's just so cool. And it's a car that you don't see anymore at all. Uh, and I think it's got a beautiful front end, very Tornado-esque. So let's take a little bit of more of a detailed look. All right, so we'll walk around this 1967 Olds. This is, as I mentioned, a base Delta 88. There was also the Custom 88, which would have a piece of stainless trim that goes down the side here. And you'd also get an extra set of tail lamps in the bumper down there. 
a pretty cool look, but this Olds 88, I think, still is a very handsome car. The one critique I would say is it has 14 inch wheels. Those are optional wire wheel discs that came with this car. And it looks humorously overbodied. The wheels just look way too small for the car, but the body is just a beautiful shape. I love how the belt line kicks up here and then the overall body shape I think is just very svelte and great looking. It also has some trademark features, I would say trademark GM styling features, like this lead in, you see the fender gently rises to its peak. If this were a Ford vehicle that would pretty much just be straight and then come back down like on the Mark 3s. But GM styling in this area just had something special about it. This car doesn't have the Tornado-esque super bulged wheel arches, but it does have very beautiful fender flares that you can see the reflections of the light and how it plays off as I walk around and just look at the fender. It's a very beautiful and graceful shape. In 1967, Oldsmobile sold about 14,000 of these Holiday Hardtop Coupes. That's about it. They sold another 12, 13,000 of the custom Holiday Hardtop Coupes. So it was not a very popular car. And these cars are gone today. I bought this one in Minnesota about three, four years ago. I saw it for sale, I think it was Craigslist. And went to go see it. I was living in Chicago at the time and I mean, how do you pass up a car like this? This car is 15,000 original miles, original paint, top, interior, chrome, everything. I just think that's a great rear end. We'll come around to the driver's side here too. You can see what I mean by it's humorously overbodied and how far inboard the wheels are. It's kind of the only critique I would have, but that was true of most every car during this period. Let's take a look inside. And again, I mentioned the door closures on GM of this era are so much better than just a few years later. Very simple door panel, nothing overly fancy, but it does have some nice real stitching on there. Quite tasteful in the mid-century modern-esque style. I mean, just look how clean the door jams are in this car. It's amazing. And a beautiful one-year-only steering wheel. I love the red center on the Oles wheel. That would change in 1968. And this is imitation wood grain on the dash, but it looks quite good and convincing. It's kind of a plain dash, doesn't have a lot of eh, flair or sportiness to it like the Pontiacs did with the beautiful dashes, but it's very tasteful and conservative, I would say. And you've got these three round gauge pods the middle one with a speedometer, the outer one here, the outer right one with a clock, and then the fuel gauge and the idiot lights. Wiper control, light control, horn, great horn. And then this car, as you can see, has aftermarket AC. And when I got the car, I was debating, well, should I just take it out? It's kind of clunky. And then I've had this car three, four years. This aftermarket AC is charged on R12, and it operates flawlessly. So I've left it in because it works and it's effective. Why not? And you can see here, this just says ventilation, left, right, max. So this would, as opposed to having the pull handles down there, you just push the button and it'll open the vent in the kick well for you. This is heat and then defrost. And I love the sound to actuate these. I mean, it's like an old hi-fi. It just feels like it's so quality. You don't get that feeling in switch gear anymore in cars. It does have the standard AM radio. And I love the turn signal in this too. There we go. Cool turn signal. And, you know, beautiful trim on the A pillars and headliner, this wonderful ribbed fabric here. This one has the optional visor vanity mirror. And this is a tinted windshield in this car, not tinted glass overall, just a tinted windshield. Does have power steering, power brakes. And let's take a look under a hood. This car has the optional, no cost, ec 
economy V8 engine, which came standard if you got a manual transmission, but it's the lower compression engine. Give me one second to open the hood. And there we are. So as I was saying, this is the low compression economy engine. You can tell by the black air cleaner cover. The red air cleaners were the higher performance, high compression engines. But it's a 425 cubic inch engine, 300 gross horsepower. The standard engine with premium fuel was a 425, also a two barrel carburetor, but with 310 gross horsepower. Optional was the four barrel 425 with 365 horsepower. And then the highest engine you could get in these cars was a 375 horsepower, 425 cubic inch Starfire V8. In the Tornado, you could get a 425 that was rated at 385 horsepower. This was the last year for the Olds 425. In 1968, it would get enlarged and become the 455. But you can see why I bought this car. I mean, look at how clean it is. This is not a detailed engine bay at all. This is just how the car was. Look at the fender aprons. They're perfect. does have the optional under hood light. Yeah, a little bit of, I guess, mice got to that, but thankfully didn't get anywhere else in the car. And let's start it up, because, boy, is this thing smooth. And we'll do my famous reach-in start. And there you go. Not a shake, not a shimmy, not a quiver. First year for the dual chamber master cylinder. And just a single exhaust on here, which works just fine. This engine runs great. Let's take a look in the trunk. Not a huge trunk, not a small trunk. You can tell the back end on this car does, oops, doesn't have much vertical height. But there you go, those are the original belts on it. That's the original spare tire. Got the plate from when it was in Minnesota. I mean, I guess it's not bad. You could fit quite a bit of stuff in here. Does have the trunk light, optional. Closes nicely. Again, just such quality in this. Look at the detailing on this. It just looks rich and expensive. It's a mid-priced car. Well, let's close it up and take it for a little drive. Okay, so here we go for a ride in the Olds, and first thing you notice is just how smooth this car is. Everything about it is just super silky. And it's a windy day, so I'm getting some you know, wind rush here on the driver's door seal, but eh, no big deal. The car is so quiet overall and just an enjoyable ride. The steering, of course, has no road feel. But this suspension is a great balance of ride and handling, especially for the time. It doesn't lean nearly as much in the turns as the Ford products of the era, or even the Pontiacs. And the 425, despite it being the economy V8, if you're just driving around town, it feels very, very peppy. If you floor it, there's not that much there. It's just a two-barrel, low-compression 425, but it's got plenty of power. I mean, I wouldn't, nothing to complain about. We're taking a turn here, and the body doesn't lean at all. One tip I will say for those of you who have one of these mid-60s era General Motors vehicles with the manual seats is a lot of them have two position seats. So you can unbolt it and move it about an inch further forward or backward. 
I say that because I'm 6'1", and when I got this car, the seat was super close to the wheel, even in the position where it was all the way back. And all you have to do is take out eight bolts. It takes a while because you're cranking. They're pretty long threaded, and you're cranking for a while. But you take out those eight bolts, and you move the seat back up position, bolt it back up, and then you got some more legroom. Or, if you're shorter, the inverse. You can see the cool turn signal again here. And yes, this fuel gauge is all over the place. Some people commented on that. Unfortunately, the original fuel sender died and was just reading E, so I had to put an aftermarket sender in it. And the original style was like a, a float in a chamber that went up and down as opposed to the ping pong ball style float that rides on top of the gas. And... Uh, the original style I think was more reliable than this one but it's accurate if I'm stopped so I just don't pay attention to it when I'm going around corners you'll see it probably goes to E or full my turn around yeah there we go around the corner it's just the gas sloshing around in the tank super smooth acceleration transmission shifts this is the last year for the turbo hydromatic 400 with the switch pitch transmission which is a two-pitch variable stator in the torque converter. So you have two different stall speeds. And the higher stall speed is activated when you push the throttle down about two-thirds of the way. And it gives you a bit more power because of the higher stall speed. And if you're just uh, driving around normally, then you're able to get more economy with a lower stall speed. So you get the best of both worlds. It was an idea that only lasted a few years, and again, the last model year for it was 1967. It's a brilliant idea. I wish they had continued it. And at, I believe when you have your foot off the gas, like at a stoplight as well, it's in the higher stall speed, so you don't creep as much as you normally would. I don't know that that's desirable, but that was the rationale for it. In any case, the carburetor on this, the Rochester 2GC, great carburetor, very reliable, great throttle response, uh, relatively big two barrel as well. I find these Rochester 2GCs seem to breathe a bit better than the Ford Motorcraft 2100s. It, it makes the engine have a little bit more top end and not mu as much of a wheezer as the Fords are. But the Fords also have good carburetors. And this is not a great road surface, but the suspension is just soaking all up all the expansion joints brilliantly. Like no car today. If you had any fillings going over this in a new car, they'd be jarring loose, but not here. In any case, I hope you enjoyed this video on this 1967 Olds Delta 88 Holiday Hardtop Coupe. If you did, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and check out the video thumbnails at bottom left and right for some suggestions for you. Thanks again for watching.